Our next speaker is Amir Gafarian, uh, who will be presenting clinical outcomes of a diagnostic and management protocol for popliteal artery entrapment syndrome at a large referral center. Well, I'd like to thank the society for the opportunity to present. I have no disclosures. So popliteal artery entrapment syndrome is compression of the popliteal artery from embryologic derangements, types one through five, or calf muscle hypertrophy, which is type six. These patients typically present with disabling claudication in the second to third decade of life, and treatment is surgical with release of the popliteal artery by lysing fibrous bands or muscular attachments, possible gastrocnemius myomectomy, and possible surgical bypass. However, diagnosis delays and misdiagnoses are common given the rarity of the condition and the fact that there are multiple more common etiologies of calf pain in young adults, specifically shin splints, stress fractures, and even chronic exertional compartment syndrome. These diagnosis delays and misdiagnoses can be related to the lack of a standardized clinical and diagnose popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. And so the aim of our study was to report the clinical outcomes of the University of Washington algorithm for diagnosis and management of popliteal entrapment at our large referral center. Our algorithm begins with a careful patient history to confirm that the patient is active, has exercise-induced leg pain that's consistent with claudication that is not due to atherosclerosis. And then we perform a physical exam to assess bilateral livers. And if there's a high suspicion for popliteal entrapment, we offer the patient a bilateral lower extremity duplex with and without provocative maneuvers, as well as treadmill ABI testing. If these are consistent with the diagnosis, we perform a lower extremity angiogram with active provocative maneuvers, plus or minus if we're For type six popliteal entrapment, we perform gastrocnemius myomectomy. And as you can see here, after the first clinical resection, we use intraoperative duplex to guide the extent of resection. You can see after the first resection, there's blunted popliteal waveforms that significantly improve after uh, repeat resection. Postoperatively, patients are admitted overnight. We apply ice packs for our protocol behind the knee for pain control, and really minimize narcotic use. We remove the 78 centimeters per second at rest to 175 centimeters per second with provocative maneuvers. 12 extremities had complete loss of flow on the duplex, and two patients didn't have a significant uh, velocity difference with provocative maneuvers. And you can see in the bottom right-hand photo that our techs are trained to have the patients lay prone with them forcefully uh, flexing against the wall while they uh, acquire these images. And then on treadmill testing, uh, the average ABI drop was 0.28 with exercise, and the mean ankle pressure drop was 11 millimeters of mercury. During dynamic angiography, uh, we, there, there were well-developed geniculate and sural collaterals at rest in 100% of patients, and all patients had complete effacement of the artery with provocative maneuvers. We had no access site complications, and we used uh, IVIS in 14 out of the 35 extremities, and the average contrast administration was 58 cc's. Intraoperatively, we discovered type three popliteal entrapment in 31 out of the 35 extremities, which again is defined as an accessory muscle slip or any fibrous bands that encase the artery. Two extremities had type five and one extremity had type two. Uh, two uh, extremities required arterial reconstruction with interposition great saphenous vein graft. The average operative time was 87 minutes with a mean EBL of 27 cc's. And postoperatively, 23 out of the 24 patients were discharged home on post-op day one. We had four wound healing complications, two hypertrophic scars in the same patient who we operated on both extremities, and then two self-resolving seromas. And all patients had symptomatic relief at a median follow-up of four months. So we report 100% technical and clinical success in patients with popliteal artery entrapment syndrome diagnosed and managed using our clinical algorithm. In our opinion, cross-sectional imaging is not necessary for the diagnosis. We had seven out of nine ex extremities who had prior CTA or MRA, and these were, um, seven out of nine were falsely negative. 
And this is due to the difficult visualization of these encasing fibrous bands or small muscular slips uh, that could be hard to see on those images, patient compliance with maneuvers, as well as the fact that these are static images. Dynamic angiography uh, will help confirm the diagnosis by allowing the surgeon to ensure that the maneuvers are performed correctly uh, when the images are acquired, and during that time allowing uh, the surgeon to assess flow and compression changes during maneuvers. It also allows you to appreciate uh, the development of well uh, of collaterals and use IVIS if needed. And finally, intraoperative duplex to confirm complete surgical release of the artery um, is essential for successful clinical outcome. I'd like to thank everyone for their time and welcome any questions. Uh, thank you for that presentation. It was a very nice uh, series. Um, did you have um, other testing that was done by providers that referred these patients to you, particularly compartment pressures? Because it seems that the people that I've been referred um, for this uh, problem tend to have um, an extensive workup and compartment pressures are done and there's a lot of other kind of things that are done. And so have these people kind of been super selected already in their referral to you um, by the providers? Yeah, definitely. Um, there was a, a considerable amount of patients that actually had fasciotomies prior to referral. I don't have the actual numbers on the compartment pressures that were done by outside providers, but they do have um, commonly very thorough workup prior to their referral to our clinic. Dr. Lee. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. It's not working. That was an excellent presentation. Um, really appreciate you bringing this to this meeting. Thanks. Congrats on awesome results. 89% um, of your patients turned out to have type 3, um, which functionally means this is, this is a type 3 cohort. Mm -hmm. um, that would be um, distinctly different from what's out in the literature in terms of commonality of each of the different types of palpatine entrapment. I think mm -hmm. we all know sort of the most common anatomic one, at least for the ones taking the boards out there, generally is type one with the medial deviation, you know, of the, uh, of, of the medial head of the gastroc. So I'm surprised false negatives were found if you found uh, type three, because even in the drawing you had there, mm -hmm. type three, there's still deviation of that, of that popteal artery. Did you see that on duplex or could you see that on some of those false negative ones? in retrospect when you look back at the CT scan? Because I think often these subtle findings, as a radiologist reads through, they just read normal popteal anatomy, no, no, major, uh, no major issue. And so we actually think getting the, getting the cross-sectional, so that's the first question. Mm -hmm. Did you look back at the ones that were false negatives and mm -hmm. actually see that you guys saw it after you knew what you found intraoperatively? And then the second question is because we feel that getting the cross-sectional imaging is probably the most important thing, and actually doing the provocative maneuvers during that saves you ephemeral stick and up and over access radiation, uh, not the radiation, and um, um, uh, that being done then basically without an invasive procedure. And, and I found the majority of patients that present like this that are young probably have type six functional, pop, uh, functional popteal entrapment rather than a type three anatomic entrapment. That's a great point. Um, to address the first question, um, I did go look back at, we had five extremities that had a CTA prior out of the nine that had prior cross-sectional imaging. And none of those, I looked back and I could not see any obvious muscular slips that would be encased in the artery. None of the arteries were deviated in those patients as well. And they weren't deviated on the angiogram either. Um, and then in terms of uh, CTA, I, I agree in, in some patients it may be beneficial, um, but um, I, you know, getting a CTA on a patient, having them go through a, you know, I know at Stanford you guys have a comprehensive protocol on how patients are positioned and your techs know how to get them to be compliant with maneuvers during image acquisition. There are C three CT scans that are performed and 370 cc's of contrast was administered to those patients. So, um, you know, you know, CT scan, you know, it could be helpful, but it does, it is associated with more contrast volume and more radiation compared to our angiogram. We didn't have any access site complications. All we had is a five French access in the, in the left groin and all the patients tolerated it well. I understand it's more invasive, but in our opinion, it gives us a, a, a more solid, uh, you know, diagnosis. We know for sure that this is entrapment. We see the collaterals, we can use IBIS if needed. And so for those reasons, you know, we lean more towards an angio rather than cross-sectional imaging.
Uh, and just to add to that, Amir handled it perfectly, but we're stickers. I mean, we, we do angios, and we, we do believe in it because we control it. You know, you have a great protocol at Stanford, and we just, you know, I think other places haven't been able to emulate that. And when you rely on protocols, it's, it sometimes ends up being an unnecessary CT scan and radiation, just like Amir said. Hi, I'm Ben Arch from Emory. Great talk. I'm actually going to ask you a question going a little bit out of the substance of the presentation, but beautiful images. One of them shows an incision, which is a midline incision, not the classic S that we're taught to do to approach this. Mm -hmm. Is that a common thing? Have you compared outcomes if you transition during the duration of the period? Or I know you do a lot of trauma, and sometimes you get that too. Is that a standard? Because I found that very interesting. I also found that you have pretty much no proper wound complication, but just seroma and keloid, so. Yeah, that's a great point. I think classically we're taught to do the, the S configuration to limit wound contracture, but we prefer the, the vertical incision and we've had no wound contractures or any uh, complications of that sort. But, um, but yeah, I don't think, you know, I've looked into this. I, don't, I haven't found any comparative data comparing vertical incision versus the, the S-shaped uh, incision, and so um, I don't think we can say one is better than the other. Just a well, quick question, Josh Greenberg. Um, just about the IVIS. Um, I, th I think IVIS can be kind of tricky in compression syndromes that it can be challenging. Did you resect anybody that did not show compression on IVIS? Uh, you know, without kind of a control group and that kind of, it just, it's hard. So I'm just curious whether you had IVIS that was non-compressive non that you still resected and did well. Uh, that's a great point. Um, we used IVIS in 14 out of the 35. All of our patients had complete effacement on angiogram, and of the 14 patients who had IVIS, all had compression. So it's not like they didn't have compression, but we still did the procedure. Yeah, and I think sometimes we, were, we use IVIS when we're looking at uh, the quality to see if there's any interval changes more than just compression, because we see that on the angio. This is just to look at the artery. Great, yeah. thanks a lot. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.